Hello, and thanks for joining us for the final talk in today's series, Standardizing Cannabis Products Could Redefine Medicine in the US. I'm Jack Rudd, Cannabis Science Editor for Technology Networks, and I'm here again to moderate this talk. I'm pleased to have Dr. Jehan Marku joining us for this talk as your presenter. Jehan is currently the Director of Research and Development at Green Standard Diagnostics, is the Senior Scientist at Americans for Safe Access, and is on the Board of Directors for the International Association for Cannabinoids Medi as Medicine. Dr. Marku is also a core qualified cannabis and synthetic cannabinoid expert. He received his PhD for significant contributions to the study of the structure and function of the CB1 receptor and the role of the endocannabinoid system in bone. Before earning his PhD, Dr. Marku worked as the California Pacific Medical Center Research Institute studying the anti-cancer properties of compounds from the cannabis plant, which was published in the Journal of Molecular Cancer Therapeutics and worked on analytical cannabis research projects in Holland. He is also an author of the American Herbal Pharmacopeia's Cannabis Monograph and is an auditor for the Patient Focus Certification Program. Dr. Marku was the first recipient of the Billy Martin Research Award from the International Cannabinoid Research Society. He has served as a volunteer for Americans for Safe Access since 2003 and is a contributing author or editor of several publications, including the Journal of Cannabis in Clinical Practice, ProjectCBD.org, The West Coast Leaf, The Philadelphia Examiner, Cannabis Is Now, and the Sensible Science blog at freedomisgreen.com. Warm welcome to you, Jayhan. Following the presentation, we will have a Q&A session and we'd welcome any questions that you may have. Please ask questions by using the chat button or you can use the Q&A button at the top left of your screen. The Q&A session is your opportunity to get live answers from Jayhan, so I very much encourage you all to ask questions. Any questions we don't have time to get to, we'll be sure you're contacted offline with an answer. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, please also let us know using the chat button. Please remember you can ask questions at any time, even whilst watching the webinar on demand. I will now hand over to Jayhan. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, this presentation is going to discuss standardizing cannabis products and hopefully through this story of, of two studies and some difficulties with implementation, we'll learn and you'll appreciate how that would redefine medicine or help to define medicine in the US. Uh, as mentioned, I, I am uh, now the Chief Science Officer for Americans for Safe Access and we work uh, of the program of ASA called Patient Focused Certification. And today I'm gonna to be sharing data um, from those programs and including our partner research institutes, the ICCI and our certified lab at the University of Chemistry and Technology, Prague. So uh, today I'm gonna to talk about the keys to acceptance. Uh, it's basically the standardization of products and their processes. And two approaches to standardizing products are using a metabolomics approach and product safety studies. And from this data and other information, such as uh, safety violations that are now published from state agencies about cannabis operations, um, that there are some implementation, implementation issues and costs of noncompliance. And so we're gonna discuss some data, what it's showing us, and some solutions to the issues. So my message to industry, if you're listening, is standardize your products. If you don't know what standardized means, um, to boil it down to its essence is to know the variability of your product. Um, and there's a fair amount of data that suggests that operators need help with this implementation. But it's also important to know, as has been discussed throughout this symposium, is that standards should go through a voluntary consensus process. And it's also important to keep in mind that we are regulating a medicine uh, with cannabis here. We're creating cannabis as a medicine. We're not creating an intoxicant. Uh, regulating an intoxicant is much easier than creating standards and regulations for a medicine or an herbal supplement. So uh, for our research and challenges, this data was generated through the International Cannabis and Cannabinoid Institute, of which I'm also on the scientific advisory board of, and you can uh, learn more about their ongoing projects at icci.science. So the first challenge in analysis comes from uh, the laboratory of Dr. Uh, Jana Hushlova, 
the head of the Department of Food Analysis and Nutrition. And they are a jointly certified lab for ISO 17025, as well as through our patient-focused certification program, which I'll discuss uh, briefly at the end of the talk. It's an international certification program, and we do have an agreement in place with an ISO accreditation body known as A2LA. And so to begin our discussion of some of the challenges is we know that cannabis has a lot of constituents, um, at least 150 different cannabinoids, many of them pharmacologically active. And we have two typical analytical strategies that are used. The one that is being used a lot is targeted analysis. We extract things out, we remove things to look at our, our, our targets of interest, our analytes of interest. However, there is an underused, very effective um, form of analysis called non-targeted analysis or fingerprinting and profiling which allows you to track what you're losing when you go through extraction and analysis. So I'm gonna demonstrate a couple of examples with this with our data. But first, we have to point out that there is a need for improvement in cannabis analysis. This is a moving target. Um, people have gone beyond just measuring THC to measuring cannabinoids at different stages of preparation inside different matrices and products. And we see a large number of laboratories in places like California that may offer a diverse array of analytical methodologies, but many have not been properly validated or have the documentation to demonstrate that they have been properly validated. Um, sometimes there are methods published by authority figures. However, many of these methods, such as the one from the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, is not intended to be a product safety method. What law enforcement is interested in here is analyzing for THC content. And so when we look actually at their method and try and make a determination, uh, is this method going to give us THC percentage? Yes, but this column does not allow isomer separation. It's, it's, the issue here is that when you see the THC peak on the chromatogram or that number, there's actually a grouping of several cannabinoids leading to inflated values. Now this might be all well and good if you're law enforcement, but if you're a consumer looking for an accurate label or you're say buying product to make a pharmaceutical preparation and you need to keep track of milligram cost, this could also be a significant issue. So we're going to talk about two sides of this wheel here. So we're going to talk about metabolomics first, and then we're going to go into safety and quality, and we'll leave the traceability for another day. But we're going to look at some data and how and why we should consider non-targeted approaches in our study of the cannabis material. And then we'll move into looking at some safety studies in terms of labeling issues of product. So when I was speaking earlier about uh, a method that doesn't allow proper separation and resolution, here is an example. Um, on the left, you see a total ion chromatogram. On the bottom, you see a mass spec. Now, that mass spec reading could actually be several cannabinoids all coming in together, giving uh, perhaps an illusion that it's one peak. But proper separation reveals that um, there's a lot of things that elute around the same time as THC. And if you're not using the proper technique or validated method, you will easily inflate the amount of THC that is present on the product. So it's important to think about this unique metabolomic fingerprint or profile because it allows you to track changes based on geography, growing practices, or perhaps the harvest year. Um, and, and product composition, as we'll show, can differ depending on the processing practice, how you extract it. You could start with a standardized material and put it through four different types of extraction processes and ends up with different products, in a sense, different predominance of terpenes or, or active constituents. At this chart here, I was just showing the relative abundance of cannabinoids in some plants that we were using for the study. So uh, for this first part of data, it was a very simple setup. We 
Um, we did. Uh, we had a patient-focused certification. Send auditors or assessors to a hemp farm uh, and implement uh, standardized protocols, procedures, harvesting practices. Uh, really went in there and made sure that they were adhering to the equivalent of good agricultural and collection practices, along with regulatory requirements and things of that nature. And uh, we acquired a standardized product for the lab in the Czech Republic. Uh, about a half gram of sample was used at a time. And this is an example of the ethanol methanol shake for extraction. You filter it and you inject it. And what we did is we used different extraction techniques on the same material. Uh, ethanol, methanol, CO2, and then water was used as a control. Uh, but you can see just by looking at the bars, you don't have to be an analytical chemist. You know, so the bars are different. So probably THC acid is the most um, interesting one in this graph on the far right. And you can see the green bar for ethanol, it's extracted very well, but with methanol and CO2, there's less uh, efficiency when it comes to the extraction. Likewise, CBG seems to be preferentially uh, extracted with CO2 uh, versus ethanol. So depending on what you're trying to create, what the specifications are of your end product, will probably help to dictate what extraction method you want to use for the products. Likewise, for analysis, uh, your imagination might say, oh, okay, well, if labs are using different unvalidated sample preparation techniques, such as what extraction they're using, they may not be taking into account these extraction efficiencies. Here is some data from the Czech lab, and this is one version of it, and I'll show another version of this slide, but these are the terpenes. Um, some of them translate quite well into English, and what we're looking at here is an ethanol versus CO2 extract versus water. And there are some differences um, when we look at the relative abundance of these compounds. So um, uh, on the next slide here is a different way of representing the same data, but mostly these significant changes. What we see here is that um, when the data is taken from this graph is that uh, like pinene, for example, is preferentially extracted in ethanol versus CO2 extraction, whereas limonene seems to prefer being extracted um, by ethanol. And so when we start to think about this in terms of osamine, carine, and some of these other terpenes that can be quite, can, that can have effects on human physiology, um, it can become an important consideration. You know, pinene is very stimulating, would keep people awake at night, whereas myrcene would be something that would be very sedating and probably help people to sleep. Um, so this is what um, an ion chromatography and non-targeted run can look like. This is run in a negative mode, and it gives you a nice shot of what's in the sample. And this is just a partial look. We have this um, validated for looking at 200 compounds at a time. And again, this is a food research lab. They're used to complex things like cookies and brownies and other things like that, that perhaps a pharmaceutical company would never dream of injecting into their really expensive analytical chromatography equipment. Um, and so, you know, the, all these methods that we use in this analysis were accredited ISO 17025. And, uh, and, you know, a lot of this data is traceable. So just a snapshot, a lot of people always ask, what are you guys using in the lab? We have a lot of toys that we get to use. And this is just for um, those nerds out there who want to know what we've been using to do some of the analysis. So the next study is a product safety study. And this is one where we looked at hemp and CBD oils purchased from the market. Now, we're looking at hemp oil, such as um, that's used as a food, which should not contain any cannabinoids, right? It's omega-3, omega-6 rich food versus a CBD oil, which has, um, you know, basically drug in it. And it gets a little complicated here because in the Czech Republic, a CBD is not a schedule substance as it is in the United States. It's listed as a schedule one compound. Um, but when we look at these, there are similar issues between whether it's treated as a food or, or a drug is that we want to look at four cannabinoids for regulatory and safety requirements, profiles of the nutrition, um, looking at aromatic hydrocarbons for 
other product safety issues. With non-targeted analysis, we can look and create a fingerprint to help identify these products and look at what's there in the product and help also to identify unknowns. So um, we've, we've removed the names of the products for these next series of slides. You know, our goal is not to point out the bad players. We can point out the good players, but this was part of a, a private study and all the companies were reached and their results were shared with them and discussed. And many were uh, surprised to learn about some of the results. But um, when we first looked at the CBD oil, that is, this is products people are buying primarily probably because they think there is CBD in it. Um, very few of these products initially tested above the legal limit for THC. And, and more than half meet um, requirements for labeled content. But there is a question of accepted variation in many samples. Um, it's on, you know, and, and some of these samples, as you can see in the bottom, didn't actually declare uh, what things like their THC content was and things like that. So when we um, make the data more palatable, and we're looking at the products here, um, we have th you know, four codes. Red is missing information on the packaging. Yellow means a small difference compared with the declared um, limit on the package. Green, it means it meets the declared or legislative limit. And, and the black dot means it exceeds a legislative limit. And so what's um, interesting is that um, most of these companies that we looked at did not have any sort of third party certification for their products that were evident on the label. Um, most do not list the THC content on the package, whether it's below or above um, certain legislative limits. Um, what was very surprising was that when you look at a very specific, say targeted analysis of um, uh, an aromatic hydrocarbon, such as benzopyrene, uh, some of these tested above the allowable limit for a product that is consumed. Uh, however, when you look at the total level, many of these other products went over into the black, as in uh, there is a ton of hydrocarbons. And that's more of a non-targeted analysis where we're looking at several, such as benzopyrene, chrysine, benzoanthracene, and benzofluorethene. Um, many of these were extremely accurate for the fatty acid content, and the CBD content was, was fairly accurate, or there were minor differences. So with hemp oil, that is the nutritional product, um, much less product issues here with this food product. Uh, the fatty acids content was spot on, and for 90% of the products, it was um, they met their declared or legislative limit for contaminants in regards to aromatic hydrocarbons. Now, we looked at the concentration of cannabinoids in the oil. And this is in milligrams per kilogram, not milligrams per gram. So the values look a little high here. Um, but we were looking at large amounts of standardized product. And there is significant amounts of cannabinoids in these, a lot of CBD, as you can see. Um, some of these products, such as the ones at the bottom, had, you know, we're, we're just at the cutoff of limit of, of uh, of quantitation, as were some other products in the center there. Now, in hemp oil, we see an order of magnitude lower of cannabinoids, many below the, the, our possibility to detect them. But they are there in some of the products in very, very, very small amounts when compared to, say, a CBD targeted extract. So, um, this ICCIUCT uh, collaboration that we're talking about is, again, looking at determining an entire range of cannabinoids, including their isomers. Um, and we're using, for the major cannabinoid analysis, accredited methods. We are engaging in metabolomic fingerprinting of cannabis plants and therefore, you know, establishing a database enabling, enabling an authentic, like, 
authenticating a, a respective sample or representative sample. Now, we need critical assessments of cannabis-based samples. In sampling, we need characterization of the variability according to the variety of cannabis, um, as well as controlling its, where it's coming from, how it's farmed, harvested, and how it's processed, as these can all give way to issues with the standardization of the final product. And developing standardization strategies which you can guarantee the composition of a product anywhere it's used, whether wherever pharmacy or access point it is dispensed from. Also allowing the control of chemical safety. You know, doing targeted analysis for pesticides, targeted analysis for solvents, and targeted analysis for heavy metals is tricky. You got to know what you're looking for. But by taking a step back and also employing non-targeted analysis, we may be able to catch some of these impurities uh, that are lost when we go straight to a targeted analysis. A metabolomic fingerprinting can also be used for plasma hair obtained from treated patients to identify the effect of certain biomarkers too. And so the metabolomic approach we discussed here along with the product safety can go a long ways towards um, standardizing products, but also helping to identify um, those factors in products and in people that will guarantee or uh, hopefully support a, a positive response to um, using cannabis as a medicine for a particular ailment. So we're going to transition a little bit and talk about um, some of the standards that have been created for quality control of cannabis and a couple stories to talk about um, that surround the issue of de developing these products and creating specifications. And so the Americans, we're going to discuss Americans for Safe Access, um, their programs, their involvement, policy support, and we're going to talk about best practices and, and how to implement these and one of the strategies that we use. So Americans for Safe Access was founded in 2003 with the mission uh, to ensure safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research purposes. Patient-focused certification is a project of Americans for Safe Access. Uh, at ASA, we've engaged in a lot of policy support, both in the U.S. And, and internationally. All of our reports are free, and I'll list the website at the end where you can download these. But the one that we do not control is the American Herbal Pharmacopeia Cannabis Inflorescence Monograph, which has been adopted by several states as the product safety standard. We also do annual reviews and grading of the states and their programs. So if you want to see a rubric that includes things like points for uh, civil rights protection, such as you know driving, and things like that for medical cannabis patients, or it's testing of the products, required training, uh, facility requirements. We grade um, the programs in different U.S. states based on what they require. We also have a regulator's program guide. So if you're interested in seeing how a third-party certification functions, you can download that uh, for free. And we also have a medical cannabis advocates handbook, which discusses um, a comprehensive guide to advocating for medical cannabis. So product safety standards are developed in a voluntary consensus way. They come from a lot of diverse sources, and this is just a handful of folks uh, and institutions that we interact with. The American Herbal Products Association hosts the standards, the national cannabis standards that have been adopted by over 20 U.S. states and form the foundation for many of the cannabis standards that are being implemented in Europe along with uh, the regional monographs that have been published by Germany, Holland, and other countries. Um, the American Chemical Society has a cannabis chemistry subdivision that we work with and have been looking into some policy issues there. The American Association for Laboratory Accreditation accredits laboratories and other operations and we and are engaged with them for our certification process as well to offer joint certification accreditation. Um, there is a lot of international work we do as well. So we have published reports uh, on critical reviews for cannabis in order to get it published. And why am I mentioning this stuff? Is because um, one of the criticisms or many criticisms whenever cannabis is denied a uh, rescheduling hearing in the US is because they say there are no standards. We uh, have no training or education for people. There are no regulations, things like this. And we read that as a roadmap. We said, okay, well, we're gonna get a monograph published. 
We're going to develop voluntary consensus standards. And all this happened over the last eight years. Uh, for those of you across the Atlantic, um, there is an institute where you can turn to for, if you're interested in these projects, this is a non-exclusive uh, institution that's doing a lot of fun things. Uh, the metabolomic approach is interesting. And so if you know some people who are interested in actually having their products studied or analyzed, we have a lab there that's focused on medical cannabis issues as well as centers where clinical trials are, are being conducted. So um, the American Noble Products Association, again, this is an important group that we're working with that hosts our standards. It's free to join the cannabis committee. So if you wanna join a, a committee that develops standards, their standards are reviewed uh, annually. Recently, APA's cannabis committee standards have been uh, um, used as foundational documents for ASTM to begin their process of creating a cannabis standards to their D37 committee. APA is most famous for creating uh, the Dietary Health and Supplement Education Act in the U.S., which allows herbal supplements and botanical products to be over-the-counter versus prescribed uh, or, F or go through the rigor of multi-million or billion-dollar FDA trials before they can be accessed. Um, this is the monograph. Uh, it, it's available to American Herbal Pharma Compia, and this is where a lot of basic foundational information has come from to allow the regulation of cannabis. If you don't have a copy of this, it is a foundational regulatory document instrumental in gaining cannabis to be accepted. Why? Because if you follow this guide, it should lead you to a standardized product. Um, the University of Mississippi has pictured in the front there an outdoor cannabis cultivation site has been producing a standardized material for decades that has been used in clinical studies in the US limited clinical studies, but used nonetheless, and uh, shipped to patients in their IND program. So when we talk about uh, uh, an expanding medical cannabis industry beyond just access from national institutions like federal governments, um, there needs to be standards. We need education. We need a verification of compliance with those standards. And so patient-focused certification is something that we've been working with internationally. And this is a nonprofit third party certification where we look at staff training, educational materials, documentation, and facility audits. And we do a lot of work with government relations and improving programs. And so these are what the seals look like. You can find some products already, uh, medical cannabis products in the US that have the seals on it for either cultivation or manufacturing. Um, we have certified laboratories uh, in Delaware, Colorado, California. Washington State, uh, who are also contributing to research as well, and including the laboratory in the Czech Republic. So when you see this seal, the PFC seal, it means that the operation is compliant with state and local regulatory guidelines. It is compliant with the APA and AHP standards, the monograph and the voluntary consensus standards. It shows overall commitment to purity and identity of products, and it and this in order to get this seal, the operations have to demonstrate they have standardized methods for how they cultivate, manufacture, distribute products, as well as laboratory testing. We were a natural fit with A2LA, uh, ISO accreditation body, except um, you know, we brought along an aspect to say ISO accreditation that was outside the scope of accreditation, which is regulatory requirements. Uh, staff training for regulatory requirements and other facility requirements such as zoning being appropriately located within your community. Um, and so the goal of this is to enhance and promote public safety. Really, whether or not you believe in cannabis as a medicine, whether or not you've read the studies, we all have the same goal, which is to protect public health. And we can do that by ensuring consistency and quality of the products, as well as ensuring proper labeling. And this is really important that we standardize cannabis as a botanical medicine. This is the foundation for human clinical studies. Um, it also increases the patient and practitioner confidence. And by standardizing products, 
Um, it basically means that cannabis will no longer be a last resort. So if you're interested, if you're a cannabis operator, you can easily apply at patientfocuscertification.org and we'll call you and go through what is this audit process? What is this documentation audit? And, you know, we don't make a decision as assessors. It goes to a review board. We have um, a review board that has 300 years of combined experience, including former presidential advisor, uh, former USDA folks, former folks who have worked with the FDA as well as in international products and assessments. Um, and they all have strong backgrounds in either pharmacology, education, biochemistry, or direct experience in the cannabis industry that is relevant. But for staff training, again, this is a really big issue in the U.S. right now. We commissioned, we designed a study last year that was published in December 2016 uh, by our, our director, Steph Shear. And what it showed is that 50% of the dispensary agents who were surveyed had no basic science or medical information about cannabis before they started dispensing products to qualify or compliant individuals in their state. And so we developed an educational program that has been peer reviewed. We just did a live training of this and it was accredited by a state nursing association as well for healthcare workers. Um, and we look at, make sure that the staff has, knows the cannabis laws and politics. They know the basics of cannabis as a medicine. They have, we have operation specific training as well as training on specific laws and regulations for those states. And what this builds towards is if, you know, we have a lab that has validated methods for everything they do, that has traceability, that is compliant with the law. It means they're capable of doing great things. They can pass peer review, they can pass scrutiny. As we have seen with our PFC certified lab in Washington state, known as the workshop, which has published an article in JAMA, along with John Hopkins researchers, on uh, product labels of cannabis products in the US. Now, this program is, is unique of its kind, but we like to pride ourselves on reducing risk and liability, verifying compliance, staff training, implementing standardized methods. Um, and this really is a great way for these operations to keep their licenses, maintain their licenses. Uh, right now, probably what keeps me the most busy is preparing operations for a regulatory inspection. And why, why do people care about that? Well, there are, it's now becoming public in the US um, uh, that the safety administrations that do these inspections are actually finding more and more serious issues that could have been prevented by having standardized protocols, standardized procedures, and employee training. For example, um, here are the top five infractions overall. And we're actually going to, next slide, I'm going to discuss what the costs of these, some of these infractions are. So one is the facility does not have written hazard communication plans that how, about how it achieves compliance with labeling containers. Think about extraction lamps and think about the methanol uh, that I talked about earlier, the ethanol. How do they dispose of that, right? Um, many operations have not trained their employees on hazardous materials or have documentation of the training prior to beginning work on hazardous materials. Um, you know, we see uh, sometimes there's a lack of a fire prevention plan. Even if the facility is in fact safe, oftentimes there are not um, policies or standardized procedures that address major hazards. Perhaps uh, one of the most shocking one is that required personal protective equipment has often not been evaluated and documented, along with associated training plans and verification for employees. Um, respirators need to be fit tested. And these can result in major fines for operations. Um, for a prevalent um, fine that I have seen in my, assess, in my voluntary assessments um, is similar to those that this government has seen. And that's um, connecting you know, temporary wiring and extension cords for high voltage situations such as cultivation lights. And those fines have raised between 3,000 to 11,000 US dollars per inspection. Um, another common fine is for using respirators without a medical evaluation, and that could be up to $7,000 per employee. So if you have, I don't know, 10 to 20 employees per facility, you could be looking at quite a hefty amount of fine. 
Um, and one OSHA reporter in an interview said that they've been averaging about $70,000 uh, fines per facilities. It gets a little bit interesting when you look um, at uh, not just cultivation operations, but operations in general, like manufacturing operations, you see blocked exits, fire extinguishers not marked, electrical panels blocked, $150,000 fine. Um, failing to maintain working fire extinguishers, that is making sure they're up to date and checked with a safety checklist, uh, almost $100,000 fine there. Um, electrical uh, failures uh, for safety, not providing railing and handrails on mezzanines, things like that. Um, but what's more interesting, and gets us back to the product safety, is it failing to report employee illness, exposing workers to infectious bacteria, um, failing to record injuries. Uh, this was basically, this could have been a, a moldy product that was taken in for processing uh, that probably shouldn't have been, or the employees weren't provided with the proper gear to protect themselves from contaminated product that they were processing. This resulted in a $1.9 million fine for this facility. Now, the summary of what I'm talking about is standardize your products so that the variability is known. Standardize your operational procedures. Um, standards exist and continue to be developed, which means that the training for your employees is a moving target. And it's gonna have to adapt as the regulations change. Um, we are actively engaged as a nonprofit uh, with other partner groups in identifying gaps and finding solutions. There are plenty of services that exist for research and method validation. We happen to be one of them. But for more information, I would say check out icci.science. Um, we have a lot of conferences, trainings, and standard groups that we participate with. And our, our like I said, Americans for Safe Access is a non-exclusive, non-competing institution. Uh, so if you want some more information, um, all of our stuff is pretty much free on our website at safeaccessnow.org slash reports. And here are, our, um, if you're interested in employee management training through our nonprofit or doctor education, or as well as looking at implementing your own product safety protocols, um, we're happy to talk about it with you. Um, I'd like to thank the graduate students and lab directors for their work with our PFC companies in analyzing these products and samples. Um, they did all the work and I get to talk about the data. Um, additional resources are here. Uh, all this stuff is free uh, that you can download and read about standards, about um, a safety uh, analysis and quality control review of cannabis, as well as all reports we've ever published are free and available online. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions you have, feel free to drop us a line with questions, comments, um, and I will now take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jahan. Um, a fantastic talk to wrap up today's event. Um, as with all the other presenters, um, I know that we're going to have quite a few questions to cover in the Q&A, um, so we'll move straight on to those now. Um, the, the first question that we had uh, was towards the start of your presentation. Somebody asked, um, I don't know if you're going to go into terpenes at all, but I did come across a paper about micron turning into benzene when people dab at high temperatures. Could you provide any information on that? Yeah, I, you know, I'm going to provide the academic answer first. And that is, you know, we see <laughs> transformations all the time happening with cannabis. Uh, many of chemists and molecular biologists have speculated that some cannabinoids appear on the plant as a result of bacterial modification. Now, when you're heating the product with an unknown source, probably not validated for combustion of cannabinoids on its surfaces, you're probably introducing things. You know, and these, these things are not uncommon in nature. You know, um, when you're processing the cannabis plant material or any plant material, you create methanol. You know, that happens. It's not that it was there, but that process creates it. And this is why the old way of thinking about product safety, like last century, uh, of where you do that, you make a product and you test it at the very end, that is over with. Uh, you need to test along the way so that you know what's happening to this product from 
intake to consumption. You should be testing these things. This is why the industry needs basic product safety studies. Nobody that I know of has actually looked directly at what happens when you take a cannabis product and apply it to, I don't know, some sort of imbued heating element. Um, Cause those heating elements have been shown to change things. The temperature matters uh, in vape pens or, or, or cartridge based vaporizers that have certain agents cut in them too high of a temperature for too long will form the release of harmful agents that wouldn't normally appear there uh, in significant amounts under lower temperatures. So um, that's the academic answer. And I think that we're getting more information about it, but there really hasn't been any controlled studies on um, uh, the, that particular form of administration of cannabis. But we know from basic quality control investigations that certain factors are produced um, during processing. I hope that satisfies your curiosity for the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and as we've had quite a few questions, I'll move on straight away. Um, it's, on a similar note, somebody has asked, how big of a concern is the benzene issue? Um, you know, that's a great question. And it gets down to how much are people consuming, right? Um, there was probably mercury in the tuna fish sandwich I had yesterday, but I'm not eating tuna fish for all my food and all my snacks throughout the day. So there's another part of this question we need to ask, which is what are the recommended dosing guidelines? What are the intake? Um, if your product doesn't have guidelines on dosage, uh, even for basic safety, uh, that's a liability. And so a lot of times products are regulated as a dose, you know, um, how, much, how much of these contaminants can be there per dose. Now there are limits like that, and then there are hard, fast limits for products. Even t-shirts, you know, have a limit of these products. And so um, much like the previous question I mentioned, hey, this contaminant is created that's not there um, when it begins. Um, so, you know, the benzene issue could be a packaging issue or it could have happened earlier during processing. But the point is what makes it concerning is when operations cannot track the problem to its source. Why are we seeing this? If they cannot provide that answer, that's when it's concerning. Um, you know, we have recall plans, adverse events reporting, um, third party testing to help companies identify problems that may have happened. You know, it's impossible to reduce risk to zero, but we can make it as close to that as possible. Um, so it is concerning, uh, but I think that we have, before we issue a press release about the danger of products, it requires further analysis. It, was this an anomaly? Was this formed during shipping? Um, are the, you know, things like that come to mind for the follow-up. Thanks again for a fantastic answer. Um, we'll move straight on. Somebody has asked, um, where can they get um, standards for more concentrated cannabinoids uh, that are greater than one milligram per milliliter? Well, that is a great question. Uh, so in the United States, uh, you can only get DEA exempt uh, products to standardize your solutions um, or standardize your, your instruments that are one mg per mil in ethanol. And these are not typically of analytical grade. These are what are called quick checks. They're very expensive. Um, and I've definitely worked in both non-DEA and DEA labs where, you know, when we calibrate, uh, when we create a calibration curve, you know, we're snapping 50 vials per cannabinoid to create a solution. So it can be, you know, it's easy to spend thousands of dollars a month. Where to get more concentrated cannabinoid standards? There isn't a solution in the US unless you have a DEA license. Other places in Europe, not so much the case. There are, you know, if you're within a laboratory that has like, de you know, in a jurisdiction that has descheduled cannabidiol, we can use the Czech Republic, it's very easy to get these standards from a reliable source. Um, what you can do, and I know there's probably some quality control people that'll be cringing when I say this, is that you can create what are called secondary reference standards from the leftover uh, waste uh, from extraction. 
This requires patience and skill uh, to do this, but it's something that uh, we have done in different laboratories is taking the waste, um, distilling out the solvent and using it again. And, um, but you still need those primary certified reference standards, those expensive one mg per mil to verify purity. And you also still need to track which samples you're, you're quantifying with the use of secondary reference standards. Secondary reference standards are not um, you know, the highest quality thing to use, but to adapt and meet regulations, I think that it can be done appropriately. And our standards do list requirements for the documentation and processing of creating secondary reference standards for laboratories. Thanks again. Uh, moving straight on, uh, somebody has asked, do you have education programs for individuals not affiliated with licensed growers or processors that wish to enter the industry with comprehensive compliance understanding? You know, that's a great question. Uh, and the short answer is, is yes. Now, and I'm not sure how comprehensive you want it to be, but if you wanted to go state by state in the US, we could certainly help you. So um, on our website, you can sign up immediately now, for example, for learning about Maryland, or um, maybe you wanna know about Pennsylvania's compliance. Uh, but we do cover that. One of our most popular video courses is, um, is about how, how to do inspections, how to audit, how to audit SOPs, standard operating procedures. But if you're interested in learning more about comprehensive compliance and just sort of how do you think about it, we have a presentation on um, cannabis inspections that we call what to expect when being inspected and it's on YouTube. And that's a kind of a free way to start, give you an overview of how to think like an inspector or assessor. Um, but we do offer, we have about 30 hours of educational content if you wanted to go through the entire national standards program. Thanks again. Um, our next question is from Lisa. Um, she has asked, will the ASA review pending laws for regulatory compli compliance and provide recommendations? Oh, absolutely. That's a lot of what uh, uh, we do. Uh, we have helped provide the guidance documents for, uh, for example, for Pennsylvania's law, which is a very large state. We do do policy advising for other states as well. We have actually have LOIs or contracts with, um, for example, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Washington, DC, um, and some US territories for providing these services. But yeah, we absolutely do review these laws. Um, our, our patchwork of medical cannabis laws, annual publication reviews these. And we do make a lot of recommendations um, in, in many states that need help. It's not uncommon for bad medical cannabis laws to pass and then for uh, us to help improve these. I can give you an example uh, in DC, uh, it used to be only legal for a medical cannabis patient to take their medicine from the dispensary home. Uh, but if they, and they weren't allowed to open it, look at it, anything until they got home or else they lose all legal protections but we pointed out that it was actually impossible to do a recall of a product if the uh, patient could not actually return the product to the operation. And so sometimes the regulations are so strict that they actually impede basic product safety, um, you know, things that other companies can do very easily. Thank you. And we've got just a minute or so left for a quick follow up on that one. Um, they've asked, do the ASA also work with health and environment departments during uh, new law rollout? Uh, yes. Um, I have trained um, many of the folks who will be going to pick up cannabis samples in California and testing them for the Department of Public Health. I go on ride-alongs with the Department of Health and other places on the East Coast. I have trained a lot of inspectors uh, and been a part of a lot of cannabis inspections for facilities that are either um, for a license, like they haven't opened yet and there's no product, or it's a, a surveillance check or it's complaint driven. Um, and yes, so, so a lot of times um, people who are going into cannabis operations don't know what to expect. 
And so we definitely train them on how to be safe in these operations, what to expect, what to look for, and things like that. Thank you very much, uh, Jehan. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, we really, really appreciate you um, presenting for us. Um, and I know that there's a few questions that haven't been answered yet. So I just want to remind everybody um, that the questions that we didn't have time to answer um, will be passed on to Dr. Marku. Um, and I'm sure that he'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and you can continue to ask questions even whilst watching the webinar on demand. 